Well, let me turn the TV off if I'm going to start the lesson. Well, I'm back, and we have another great lesson for this week. As a matter of fact, we're really picking up where we left off last week. We're still in Chapter 5, and uh, Jesus is still on the uh, preaching on the hillside of the Sermon on the Mount. But before we begin, let me uh, ask God to bless us with this lesson. Dear Lord, here we are, gathered together to study your word. We want to take the time to say thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Lord, we ask a special blessing on the bereaved and the sick everywhere, Lord. Lord, please have mercy on them all. And then, Lord, we ask that will you please direct and guide our leaders of this country, of this state, of this county, Lord. We need you. We need your guidance. And, Lord, we want to take this opportunity to say thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, please bless everyone that will be listening and watching this video even today or tomorrow. Bless and keep us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's I'm back. Let's see who we have tonight. There's there's my little sis Renee, so spicy. Good to have you. Uh, Sister Ridgeway, good to have you. Enjoyed your company on yesterday. Uh, Irene, it's good to have you. Let's see if I see anybody else. I don't see anyone just yet. And uh so we, we're going to go ahead, I don't know, and get started. Oh, somebody else popped up. Oh, Sister Brazil, good to have you. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. So we're back, and we're still in the Gospel of Matthew, and we're still in chapter number five. And as a matter of fact, it's almost a continuation from last week's lesson. So without me just talking and holding up time, let's look over and see where we are studying from on uh, today. And as you can see, hello, Roz, good to have you, darling. And who else is out there? Yeah, good to have you. And Tammy Strange, hello, Tammy, good to see you. All right, our lesson, we're in unit one, understanding God's kingdom. And this is lesson two, and we're studying out of the Union Gospel Press book. Our topic for today is A Perfect Kingdom. The time is A.D. 28, and the place, the uh, mountain near Capernaum, which I told you that it's uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, we're in Matthew, still in chapter five. We're, we're going to do verse 17 and 18. Then we're going to skip and do verse 21 and 22. Then our lesson skips to 27 through 28. And then it skips to 38 and 39. And then uh, verse 43 and 44. And of course, I'll be reading our scriptures from the uh, New Living Translation. But I will refer sometime to the King James because that's what the book has. All right. Now, as we see we have uh, our golden text, and our golden text read, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. And our King James reads, it reads like this in verse 17. He says, think not that I I am come to destroy the law, all the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. All right. And our lesson has three outlines, as you can see. The first one is the law fulfilled, and that's verse 17 and 18. And then the second outline is the law interpreted, verses 21 and 22, then verse 27 and 28. And the third outline is the law of love, and that's verses 38 and 39, and then we go down to 43 and 
44. Now, as I said, this is really a continuation from our lesson from last week, but we are going to, uh, hello, Clint, good to have you. We are going to uh, pick right back up because last week we ended at verse 16. Now, as I said, Jesus was still teaching. He wanted to teach these disciples probably, but as word spread around at this good teacher, the great rabbi, people started flocking in behind him so they could hear more. But now keep in mind, there were everyone who was there to listen were not in favor of Jesus. There were some of the uh, Pharisees and the Roman uh, government watching to see what was going on. But as we know through our studies, that it was really the Pharisees, the leaders and religious leaders that didn't want Jesus to be successful. But in this case, uh, Jesus was teaching them and the crowd was listening and he's still going on. Hello, uh, Ruby Baldwin. Good to have you. Deborah Price. Good to see you, darling. So let's get to our uh, first outline. And as you can see, we're talking about our book says the law fulfilled. And our scripture reads in verse 17, which was our uh, golden text. It says, don't misunderstand why I came. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophet. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. In verse 18, it says, I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear. Not even the smallest detail of God's law would disappear until its purpose is achieved. All right. Now, as we can see, we're picking up with this verse 17. Now, a lot of the uh, Jewish leaders, they wanted Christ to come and, and really teach what they had been teaching, but a lot of them misinterpreted the law. They added to it and they take they took away from it. And that's what get a lot of us in trouble now when we sit under a lot of uh, teaching that is not strictly sticking with the word of God. And there's enough uh, other commentaries and things that we can study and see other writings to make sure that we have the proper understanding of God's word. So in this particular case, hello, Elaine, good to have you. In this particular setting, they thought that Jesus was going to come and be their great ruler. He was going to be a great military officer, but that was not his purpose. And he's letting them know, no, 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 get, get that out your mind. That's not what I'm coming here for. He's telling them that he was coming to fulfill the law. As he told them, he says, look, don't, don't, in other words, don't get it twisted, uh, y'all. That's not what I was coming for. So people had was kind of getting a little discouraged because, see, they wanted this king. They wanted to overthrow the Roman government and rule, but that was not Jesus' purpose of coming to the earth. His purpose for taking on a human body was to offer salvation for all of us, not to be king over the, the Roman Empire. No, he come from he came from a kingdom. He wanted us to be prepared to go to that kingdom, which is God's kingdom. And he says, he says, I have come not to abolish the law of Moses and the writings of the prophets. See, the Lord gave those instructions to Moses. Remember up on Mount Sinai when he, um, hello, Jackie, when he uh, gave them the Ten Commandments and all those laws to live by. And then he says, no, I didn't come to change that. And, and uh, the Lord is telling him that he, he didn't come he wasn't changing one thing. And the King James said that in that verse 18, it says, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not, it says, one jot or one tittle shall be no wise passed from the law till all be fulfilled. In other words, Sister uh, uh, Ridgeway, come on, help me. In other words, not even the punctuations in the law was going to change. He didn't come to change no, no comma, no little letter, no uppercase letter. That's what he's letting them know. He says that when the King James says no tittle, 
And he, in verse uh, 18 in our New Living Translation, remember he says, I tell you the truth. In other words, he's letting them know, I'm telling you, this is the authority that has been given to me. He says, until heaven and earth uh, disappear. He says, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until what? Its purpose is achieved. And Jesus is letting them know, like the King James, I had to look that up and see what a jolt and a, a tittle was, but it was talking about how it was written. And they used, I think in the Hebrew, they had certain little asterisks and things they had upper and lower, like we have upper and lower cases. We have punctuations that are commas, that are uh, semicolons, they are quotation marks. So he's letting them know none of that's going to change. Nothing that was written is going to change until, guess what he says, until its purpose is achieved. What he's letting them know, he didn't come to do that. And he didn't come to rewrite the law. He came to fulfill the law. That was that was enough to be said to let them know, hey, Jesus is not playing. He didn't come here to rewrite nothing to please us. He was fulfilling what was prophesied back in the Old Testament. And that's why he's letting them know. I really enjoyed that uh, Rosalind and Sister Ridgeway when they said not one little joke or one little tittle. Now, y'all know I like to go back and make sure I'm understanding. But it all it boiled down to was how the law was written. Just like when we write uh, letters and, and write, uh, uh, we're making a presentation or we need to make a written uh, uh, proposal. You have to know how to structure that sentence and know how to punctuate it to get your point across and do it professionally. Jesus is telling them he wasn't changing the law. He was not going to be like the uh, the prophets that rearranged the, uh, would add on to the law or take away from the law. He's saying, no, every detail was going to stay the same until the purpose of the law was fulfilled. Am I right, Sister Ridgeway, Elaine, y'all? Somebody help me out there and let them know that I'm not making this up. So as we can see, then that's what he was telling them as he continued to talk to the disciples and the people. Now let's look at our next outline. It says the law interpreted. Y'all see this? And this is verse 21, 22, and then we're going to skip down to 27. And it reads, uh, verse 21, you have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. Verse 22. But I say, he go with that authority. He's letting them know. I say, if you even, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. If you curse someone, not, not cussing, curse, y'all, cursing, cursing, curse someone, you are in danger of the fire of hell. And then verse 27 reads, you have heard commandments that say you must not commit adultery. He said, Jesus, he come with his authority again. But I say, anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, as we can see, uh, 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 Sister Ridgeway and Sister Baldwin, where it starts off, where it says, you have heard that our ancestors were told you must not commit uh, murder or you are subject to judgment. In other words, they just let them know that if you committed murder, you would go against, you would have to go to court. And sometimes people would get off. But now remember, you're going to have to stand for murder in that final judgment. Will you be able to get off? You're going to have to ask God for forgiveness. So he's telling them this. He said, you heard that. But then he's correcting what they, the part that they didn't emphasize enough. And that is that verse 22 where it says, but I say, this is him with his authority. Who has more authority over God's law than Jesus Christ himself? If you are even angry with someone, y'all, that's talking about being mad. 
you know, when you're angry, your heart is angered and you will speak and do evil things. He says, you are subject to judgment. Now, what he's telling them, even when you get angry and you uh, ridicule your brother or you call him, I think this one said, call someone an idiot. I had to check myself, y'all, because <laughs> when I see people, it just look like they're acting like just totally out of control. I was like, look at that idiot. This is going, I did not know that you shouldn't call someone an idiot and to uh, to uh, offend them in their face. Because this says, he says, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought to the court. See, back then, if you call your brother or somebody like that, you had to go to court. You was, you was just, they would judge you for that. And he's saying, you are in danger of being brought before a court. I thought about that, you all. Anybody listening to me? <laughs> you know, we say things and it's funny, but really and truthfully, I would not offend a person and say that out loud. Because, you know, we when I used to tell my kids, you're, act, you're acting silly. You're being stupid. Stop acting stupid. And somebody said, you shouldn't call them stupid. I didn't say they were stupid. They were acting in that manner. And then it says, you in danger of, of fire, the fires of hell. So Jesus is letting them know. And in the King James, in that verse 22, you all, it says, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. Do y'all see that? People, families fall out, y'all. Come on, somebody talk to them. They fall out and stop talking to each other over the silliest stuff, the minute stuff. And it says, with your brother, Reka, Reka, you hear me? R-A-C-A, -A, that's what's in the Bible, shall be in danger of counsel. But whoever, whosoever says, thou fool, you see there, shall be in danger of the fire. These are things that Jesus, that they didn't say. They just said about, uh, don't commit murder. No, it, we got to watch our mouth. Do you know that we murder people on a daily basis with our tongue? We talk, we say things. Now in our day, they saying and doing whatever they want out loud. It used to be a time growing up, you, it was certain things a woman didn't say out loud or a woman didn't do out in front of people. Now, they don't care. They do whatever they want. And y'all, that's a sin. That is a sin. It's a sin to, you, you got to, uh, you upset with your brother, Irene, or your sister. You out there just, just using foul language left and right. But that's your sister. That is your flesh and blood. You won't go to court today for it. But guess who is in judgment and watching us right now? We should have that love for each other. Now, yes, we get upset and we fall out. But I'm not going to use foul language and talk to my family members like that. Because guess what? I'm going to have to give an account of that. And then look at verse 22, where uh, 27. He says, you have heard the commandment that says, here's a good one, y'all. Here's, here's one we all know about. You must not commit adultery. Now, the, the prophets were saying, just committing adultery. Don't, you ain't supposed to sleep with somebody else's husband or you're not supposed to have sex before marriage. We know this. This is this this is nothing new, but that's all they were saying. But look in verse 28 when, when Jesus says, but I say, he's giving his authority again, you all. He says, but I say, anyone who looks at a woman, do y'all hear me? He says, looks at a woman. Same thing apply to us women that look at a man. And it says, with lust has already committed adultery in his heart or in her heart. So in other words, God knew when he made Adam and he made Eve from Adam to be his helpmate. When God asked Adam, what, what, she, what, what you going to call him? He said, woman, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He admired what he was looking at. God already knows that men and women will look at each other and should admire each other in a decent way. I I, I never have uh, been so caught up. Ooh, he looks so good, you know. Ooh, y'all, ooh, look at him. He looking good. Uh-uh. If a man is well-dressed and he's he looks well-dressed and groomed, I will compliment and say, now, nah, that brother got it going on. He dressed real sharp. Same thing with a man. When a man 
is looking at a, a woman and he's not just saying, oh, she's a pretty lady and go head on. No, he's lustful. Y'all know. Come on, somebody talk to me. Uh, 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 Tammy, talk to me. Somebody out there, help me out. When you, when you, when you go over the line, as I would say, you've already committed adultery in your heart and you haven't physically touched that person, but your thoughts, you know, which as a man thinketh, so is he. So in other words, if you looking at this woman and all lustful, you have already committed adultery. And this is what Jesus was telling them. Cause see the, uh, the prophets just said committing adultery. He talking about, they were just talking about the physical act, but Jesus knows something and he's telling us no, because when you, when you desire and looking at someone and them thoughts is running through your mind and you, you, you looking and you're trying not to look and you, you, you're not just look admiring a person because of, of their looks. God made woman for men. Women are beautiful in the eyesight of men. A lot of, a lot of women don't get, they don't understand that. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what your shape is. God made us to be pleasing to the eye of man. Not that every man should be uh, lusting after us. That's what this is. Jesus is telling them to don't do that because that leads to sin. You've already, you've already committed the sin, <coughs> excuse me, because you lust after that. Lust is evil. That's sin. That's sinful. So as we can see, that's what Jesus, I like when he says, but I say, our Lord is letting them know, I'm telling you the truth and I have this authority. Okay. And then let's not get angry. Like I said, because anger will make you do and will make you uh, become sinful. Even your thoughts of anger will cause sin. And we don't, I, we don't need no one, no nothing else to add to our sins that we've already committed or that we do commit. So let's look at our last outline. And it's talking about the law of love. And it uh he's talking about, you know, he just got through talking about adultery but, uh, and physical lust. Now we're talking about love. And it reads, verse 38. Have you heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In verse 39, look what it says. But I say, there he is with his authority again, and he's letting them know, I'm telling you the truth. Do not resist an, an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, off of the other cheek also. And look at verse 43. It says, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. All right. Now, let's back back up. Now, when I read this, uh, uh, Rosalind, I really had to, Keep that in mind when he talks about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Well, you know, if you like me and you 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 grew up poor and you know we get to fighting over anything, you better not take something of mine and do. But in this case, it's talking about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, because in that culture in that day, if someone plucked out another man's eye, they had to write to go pluck his eye back out. And then if they knocked out somebody, say it was a fight going on and they got into a fight and knocked out. They, they knocked out Rosalind's tooth by mistake. Well, this is saying the, the, uh, the, the, pro, the, uh, the prophets told them, well, Rosalind had the right to go knock out their tooth. But Christ is saying, but I say, do not resist the devil. In other words, we are not to flee from him. We are to be the peacemakers. And it says that do not resist evil people. You know why? A lot of times people that are evil and grumpy, they have never seen the love of Christ. They go around picking a fight or being just mean because they don't know no better. But if they're picking on you, what would he say? If someone slaps you on the right cheek, off of the other. Okay, uh, uh, Deacon Randall, I, 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 I'm going to tell y'all something. That one I had to really pray over because I'm, I'm a girl from the, from the hood. You hit me, I'm hitting you back because I was raised, don't hit nobody first. 
But if they hit you, you have a right to hit them back. But this is not what they're saying. When they're acting evil and crazy and they want to, they, 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 he says slap them. If they slap you, turn the other. How many of y'all out there like me? We, we go to Fifth City. No, uh, you're not finna slap. But when you have been born again, you can resist that want to hit back. Because, see, they're looking for you to make you angry and to say, see there, I got you. But God has us covered. They hit you on one cheek, turn the other one. But he didn't tell them if they hit that one that you are to resist. Y'all remember that. Stand your ground and show that God is with me. And God is going to protect you. He's going to tell you if you need to strike. But in this case, he's they were telling those people, don't go out knocking out people's teeth out their head or or somebody is in a fight and they shoot something and they put out your eye where they weren't really aiming at that particular person. But the way the uh, prophets were saying, you have a right to go do it. And Jesus is saying, no, you don't, because you don't want to cause harm on somebody else. And then verse 43, I, I'm looking at this where it says, you heard the law say, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. Well, see, they would see what this is what I was saying, how the prophets were adding to the scriptures, the law, and trying to make things, you know, the way they wanted. That's why people had such a hard time, Irene, uh, trying to keep all those laws because they kept changing and adding to them till they were just impossible to, to, uh, to live by because we are sinful creatures. What is that scripture that says uh, that I was born in uh, iniquity and I was born out of sin and shaped into iniquity? That means that it's go, it's a constant battle going on. And when he says that, he says, I heard the law say to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. No, Jesus didn't tell us. The God, when he gave those laws to Moses, it was not for us to hate anyone, not less, let alone our enemy. That's the very person that we should be showing compassion to is our enemies. Because even like the evil, the one that's just mad all the time, angry, those people there's something going on within that they don't know how to be lovable and how to be pleasant. Even your enemy, they say, hey, no, we're not supposed to hate. Christ, Christ didn't come here for us to hate anybody. That's why he told us this. But I say, you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And yes, I know, Irene, I know, I know Sister Ridgeway, I know uh, Sister Baldwin, I know Rosner, Clint, I know. It's Sometimes it's just hard to love your enemy because they can hurt us so bad. We let our feelings take control, but we ought to be strong enough in God and say, Lord, forgive them because they really don't understand. Because when you're innocent, and you know you haven't done anything to that person. Why would you want to hate them? They don't know what you know. They don't have what you have. They don't understand God's love and salvation that he has given us. They don't know. So don't you hate them. Don't be like that. What we should do, pray for them. And yes, Sister Ridgeway, it, it's times when our old nature will it, it, it be up to here, y'all. I don't know about y'all, but mine's be... <laughs> I'm still trying to bubble up over there. And the old Deborah want to say, I done had enough. But no, when you've grown and you study God's word more, you'll know how to control your emotions. Guess what? You are being a witness to somebody else. And pray, pray, constantly pray for those that persecute you. And am I right, Jackie? It's it's hard to get them them beat downs all the time. It's hard when you when you're trying to live a a God given a uh, right life to show each other that you love, and somebody's always trying to press you back down. But what you do, you pray for them, and you pray for yourself. You pray for them most of, cause God has already gave given us the key how to succeed and how to live in this life, and that's what He's teaching them right here in this uh, lesson about. The, uh, the law of love. Love can, can heal a lot of broken hearts. Compassion for those that are less fortunate. Compassion for those that mistreat us or what the, our lesson says to persecute us. Those that lie on us or talk about us. But we don't want to get down in that mud with them. No, we want to stand up and pray and ask God, God, I need your help. 
I need you to help me because this is I, it's getting hard to deal with this. Do you know that when you pray and you pray for the other person first, you pray for that angry person, you pray for that person that they considered your enemy and pray for them and w- watch and see how God will make that enemy become your footstool that will elevate you. And that enemy, that enemy will come back. And apologize when God changes them. And just think about it. You don't have to ask God to forgive you for doing something wrong to your enemy. God has already blessed you. Amen. This is our lesson. And I hope that something was said and done that you will uh, get a better insight of this. And it's like I said, that when I read that about uh, Rekha, that how we are not supposed to call the people idiots. I had to check myself, y'all, because I say it jokingly, but I didn't realize, but I, I I wouldn't call someone that I care for an idiot or a or, or wrecker. No, I don't want to do that. And I'm not going to cuss out my family members, even though there are some that do that. And some of us might have did it before, but ask God to forgive you. You've got to stand in the judgment for yourself. And I'd rather ask God to forgive me now. Then when I go and have to meet him and he tell me, depart from me because he know me not. And I I didn't accept Jesus to the fullest as his son because Jesus has left on record for us how we should treat one another and to show love to those that, uh, like I say, people that don't even like me, Sister Baldwin, I still got to love them. I can be lovable and be patient with them. And, and and not be angry towards them. Because, see, I can go home and go to bed at night. I'm not laying up trying to figure out why this person did that or, or did do, and, and why they did it. Why did they talk to me like that? No, I go home and pray and go to bed. Amen. But glad to have you all. If I didn't see your name, I was trying to uh, be a little bit more timely and get this lesson over to everyone. So, as always, be blessed. May God keep you all. And those of us that go to the same church, I'm asking a special prayer for our pastor and his brother and his sister. These are some tough days, but if we pray, God will take care of it all. And until the next time, I'll see you then. It's a good time.